second. So welcome everybody. Uh, so to this joint engineering physics uh, RQMP uh, seminar. So it's, um, I have a conflict of interest. Maria is a very good friend. So I declare it since the very beginning. So Professor Olusko from the Institute of Mining uh, Engineering at the University of British uh, Columbia. So uh, with more than 25 years experience in mineral and coal uh, processing, so is the speaker today. Uh, Maria uh, got her PhD degree in 2006 at the University of British Columbia. And then uh, it's a really curious uh, also uh, career. Then she moved to the Kruchnet Mineral Research Center uh, at Queensland University. Now, more recently, she, she was anyway the chair of the minerals engineering section of the Canadian Institute of Mining, uh, um, of Mining and Metallurgy. Now, uh, what it's interesting, uh, particularly interesting, I think for us uh, here is that she co-founded the Urban Mining uh, Innovation Center uh, at, uh, at UBC. I cannot, find the right word to say how I believe this field is important from, uh, uh, of course, environmental uh, and uh, social aspects, but also from very, very interesting uh, fundamental uh, issues, problems uh, uh, from the purely scientific point of view. So, uh, Maria, I think we are truly honored to have you with us uh, uh, today. Your uh, interesting career and your, uh, uh, I mean, remarkable uh, uh, experience are really uh, a gift for us. I would leave you so the stage to you for about, uh, I think, 45, 50 minutes. Then, uh, of course, uh, uh, the period of question answer with a specific, if I'm not wrong, uh, uh, Professor Seleski, with some a few minutes just dedicated to the student of uh, the uh, seminar course in engineering physics. Please correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, everything is correct. So, so we will have a standard Q&A session and at the end we will ask all the audience members to leave and then we'll have a one-on-one -on -one session with the students at Poly the registered students at Polytechnic. Perfect. So I would leave the stage to Professor Olusko for a talk today. Okay, well, good morning everyone. Bonjour. Um, I would like to thank you very much, uh, Professor Santata, for um, the introduction and I'll start my presentation shortly so we have more time for questions so please bear with me I'll, I'll share the presentation with you um, immediately thank you Let me just see my. I'm not sure you can see my presentation right now. Not yet, Maria, not yet. Yeah. Maybe you can give it another try. Okay. Yeah, just a second. It's just not showing on my. We, we don't see it. Uh, we don't see it. Okay, let me just. Not there? Well, yes, now it's fine. I think you can choose the full. Uh, I will just uh, a second. Yeah. yeah. Let me just start. Huh? Is it okay now? Perfect. Beautiful. Okay. All right. Perfect. Thank you so much. So, again, um, I would like to invite you to my presentation on urban mining and the title of my presentation Recover of Value from Electronic Waste. As Professor Santata mentioned, I'm a professor at Mining Engineering and co-founder of Urban Mining Innovation Center. So with the outline for presentation, a short introduction, background information on e-waste, 
I will look at the electronic circularity, recycling, and I'll also showcase some of the research work that I have done in this area. So looking at reprocessing non-metal fraction, fraction from the waste uh, PCB, printed circuit boards, LED recycling technology development using various techniques to dismantle an LED, lamp, LED as an e-waste, high voltage fragmentation technology, um, X-ray transmission, optical sorting for um, LED waste, as well as recovery of gold from electronic elements using ecological reagents. And I'll wrap up with the conclusion. So let's um, look at the electronics world. So electronics providers with many benefits leading to overall improvement of every aspect of our life. Be they became essential part pretty much of everybody's life. It's availability, widespread use have enabled us much of the global population to benefit from higher standards of living. However, the way we produce, consume, and dispose or not to dispose electronics is untenable. So digitalization uh, enable us to have a wide access to pretty much everything what we need, the education, instant information, nonstop entertainment, mass communication. And as you can even see from where we are, um, this year and last year that it provides us to opportunity to function as a normal society, productive society during the, those extraordinary days um, or times as current pandemic situation. So let's start with the definition. So e-waste is a term used to cover items of all type of electro electric, electronic equipment, and it has been part that has been discarded by the owner as a waste without intention of reuse. It means at the end of the life, we don't need them anymore. So according to um, European Commission, the categories of waste are as follow, temperature exchange equipment, screens, monitors, lamps, small equipment, large equipment, and the most importantly, telecommunication equipment. So internet, technology, so everything what we use every day. So cell phones, computers, anything that provides us this link to the uh, rest of the world. On the other hand, e-waste is the fastest growing um, waste. So when we look at the statistic, total e-waste 45 million tons in 2016, but more than 53 in 2019 projected to grow 75 in 2030. When we look at the estimates from 2017, we pretty much exceeded um, already what was estimated um, some uh, three years ago. Total US in Canada, almost 800 tons per year, growth rate three to 4% per year. And out of that only 17% is being recycled. This is just across the uh, world. So this is the average of how much. When we look at US generated per capita in the world, uh, we can see some areas that there is a more e-waste generated. Usually it's coupled with the um, uh, richness of societies. And um, so this is important to keep in mind that Western uh, societies um, use more and generate more e-waste on, on everyday basis. So this is the annual um, annual statistics. And there are several reasons why we would like to uh, recycle. There is um, value in it. We use um, many metals to produce, to manufacture electronics, many precious metals, um, critical metals, critical materials. So value in 2017, uh, 55 billion euros, 2019, close to 57 billion of US dollars. So there's quite a bit of value locked in in the electronics. Um, resources saving, while well, we can, uh, by recycling, we can actually uh, save some of the resources by not extracting from um, raw materials from the earth. Health and safety, hazardous metals and chemicals. Usually when we manufacture these electronics, there's a lot of chemicals used as for example, flame retardants, those are toxic ones. So from economic point of view, why to recycle? 
If you look at this table here at the bottom in yellow, ore mine usually contains less than 1% of copper. And here, bonds and PC um, and computers have sometimes tens and hundreds more in the content. So one ton of ore versus one ton of electronic waste. And we use rare earth element smartphones, which are critical metals. Not that we always can recycle them um, efficiently from our electronic waste. But anyway, this is what creates this value in electronics. So um, looking at why to recycle, again, the monetary value, amount of various metals locked in in the um, electronics, value of metals and materials in e-waste. So you can see a definitely dominantly uh, precious metals, gold, in terms of value, plastic actually, it's in terms of value also consists quite a bit of value in our e waste. And copper is the one which is actually in quite large quantities. So the value is actually related to the um, amount. So, why to re recycle hazardous metals and chemicals, halogenated chemicals, all the PCBs, PBBs, P polybrominated? radioactive substances, and obviously metals, which are also uh, toxic. So uh, in terms of resource saving, natural, according to Natural Resources Canada, um, statistics from 2019 show that globally, 18% of aluminum is locked in, where um, used for electronic equipment manufacturing, 30, over 30% 30 of copper, 10% of gold, 9% of, of platinum group metals and 24% of rare earths. So this is where we're looking at resource saving. So if we um, look at 87% laptop recycling and desktop at 80% rate, we can save the resources, meaning we won't have to uh, extract these metals from the environment. In our cradle to grave economy, we refer to it as cradle to grave, but really it's linear material flow. We extract the resources when we convert them into the uh, products by manufacturing. And at the end of the sometimes very short life, for some of the electronics, the life is very short, uh, sometimes less than two years. Uh, we dispose them with some, to some extent, recycling has been designed to extract metals, extract some of the most valuable things, but not to the great extent. And, and mostly it was uh, providing us with shortages of some of the resources. So the fate basically is the landfills and incineration if we don't recycle um, everything and to the point that we make sure that not much is left after the final recycling. So cradle to grave in transition to circle economy. So this is something where you like to imagine the world that if we extract resources, we prepare raw materials, process raw materials, manufacture um, products and package transport, use, reuse, and then we do really good job on recycling. Um, at this point, we are where we trying our best to recycle, but as you even seen from the statistics, only 17% of um, e-waste around the world has been uh, recycled. Some countries do better job than others. In Europe, more than 42% of the e-waste is recycled. In North, in America, it's less than 10. Um, in Asia, on average, more than 10, 11%. So as you can see, it depends where we are, different uh, models um, uh, persist. But in terms of circular economy, we would like to go to the point where not only we can recycle the well, but also we can repurpose the final waste. It means whatever is left over, we can make a good use of it. Or at least minimize, reduce to the point that it's not um, contaminating our environment. So with the current recycling scenarios, we usually do the collect, collection and sorting, which is done in many jurisdictions by municipal um, um, organizations. Then dismantling physical separation is usually done at the recycling centers. A lot of it's done by manual um, uh, labor. And processing means 
only the parts of the leftover from dismantling physical separation, if there is any valuable metals, will extract by uh, pyrometallurgy, hydrometallurgy. So end processing means uh, getting the metals. So when we look at other approaches for recycling, meaning something which we can uh, claim as a better way moving into circular economy means we'll have to look at recycling low volume materials. So when we look at our electronics, there's high value. So those are all the metals and there's non-metal fraction, which is part of um, electronics. And normally this would not present um, values for recycling. So recycling, as we've already have learned, saves energy required to produce metals from ore. Currently recycling of metals might supply five to 10% of the world demand. A large of metals are still in service. So when we look at the theoretical recycling potential, on average, we're talking about the metals, not necessarily electronics, 25% theoretical maximum is that um, we should be able why? Because we still use some of the material that it's manufactured. So today minus lifetime of products and looking at the current demand, if we increase theoretical recycling, then we reduce the theoretical gap to be filled with mining. Not that we can completely um, uh, remove the mining from the scenario. So when we talk about smart recycling and end processing, what does it mean? were designed for efficient separation at each step and design for recycling of non-metal, for example, in electronics, as opposed to just metal. Make sure that we design in such a way, step by step, meaning that we can scavenge all the valuables and we don't have to crush and grind to very fine in order to um, destroy the properties quality of other than metal uh, parts. Um, that's what we do in mining. We got uh, something which is less than 1% of metal and we have to get to 40%. So there's opportunity and there's also uh, technology in some other parts of industry that we can adopt for cycling. So find the best solution with the focus on sustainability, meaning reducing, minimize the final waste and process in such a way that we can actually scavenge things that then be used for something else. Technology-driven solution. <laughs> Go outside of the box and find something which could be tested and provide better um, opportunities that's what exists. So I'll uh, uh, talk about a few of my projects that my group has been involved in. One of them was reprocessing of non-metal fraction from waste printed circuit boards. So this is the essence of circular economy that we have to look at the low value material for recycling. We had uh, the company which was participating in the project and they were processing printed circuit boards and cell phones. Um, when we look at what's in a circuit board, usually um, globally 6% by weight of total e-waste. So not, this is not a lot. But when we look at the value, is 40% of total e-waste. So if you really calculate, $21,000 per ton. So this is quite high value. So major metals, mostly copper, silver, gold, uh, palladium, and all the uh, base metals. Total metal content, 20 to 26, majority of it is uh, copper. So looking at the composition, we have metallic fractions, base metals, precious metals, rare earths. Usually when we do um, recycle, these are extracted and sold for metal extraction. When we look at the non-metal fraction on the other hand, what we have left over is the fiberglass, plastics, resin, residual metals if the separation at the stage of metal extraction is not efficient. And obviously, this is also all these plastic resins, uh, fiberglass are coated with the flame retardant. So this is what we are left after we get the metals out. And uh -huh. normal scenario, the landfill or incineration is the uh, fate of this material. So for the sake of the projects, um, the concentration was to look at, the focus was to look at the quality of non-metallic fraction and 
elaborate what can be done with this and how well we can separate what's in it and how well we can uh, separate. So in terms of composition, the non-metal non um, fraction composition, 70% by weight of printed circuit board is this non-metal fraction. So majority of material is in that form. Fiberglass, 65%, epoxy resin, 30 and residual metals that can vary from three to five percent. And as I mentioned, if not taken care of properly, it will end up in the landfills or incineration. Commonly for um, recycling, we would shred, we will fine grind if we need to unlock those metals and the, the focus is to recover metals, non-metal fraction by the time we grind to extract locked metals, we have pretty much very messy um, mass of the materials, which is uh, useless if we do this in a sequence like that. There is alternative technology, um, and obviously some of the recyclers practice that, and one of the recyclers that we work with was born in aid. So they adopted this um, circular economy concept that we will do better job at um, a crushing coarser, separating at coarser sizes and do this step by step. So the material was a not pure, a not uh, um, a brand new circuit boards, but there was the uh, waste, electronic waste circuit boards were shredded, then they were crushed by hammer mill. Liberation was done by, the, by their um, uh, patented technology, sonic liberation in combination the water-based shaking tables. So as you can see, the idea was to actually make sure that we can scavenge and we can separate by physical and using uh, water um, uh, cleaner processes. So metal was extracted and what was left was non-metal fraction that um, we got to work with. As a research group, we were um, analyzing this material. So, um, the first thing was to get the non-metal fractions separate into gravity fractions and look what's in there and um, establish the um, energetic value, calorific value. So that was the testing methodology to so characterize the material, uh, perform sink and float, get the um, density fractions, analyze them, and um, also analyze for metal content, analyze for the um, flame determines polybrominated um, uh, chemicals. So that was done um, following a standard methods for the, uh, for the environmental samples. So samples characteristics look like this. We had the PCB feed. So this is the e-waste material, which had um, nine gigajoules per ton calorific value, then non-metal fraction almost double, because if it's organic, it, 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 it does make sense, that's what it is in there. So there's already an um, increase in um, energy value by the fact that we have all the um, organic um, materials in there. So when the gravity separation was done, we could, uh, we looked at the course, the top size of the material after shredder and, and, and um, hammer mill was um, actually was um, one millimeter. And the material for this analysis was split into two fractions, plus 500 and minus 500 to 75 microns. So as you can see, 60 to 70% of material already was um, distributed into the lighter fractions. So that makes sense because that's how much of the plastic resins we, we expected. So when we look at the um, materials physically, you can see right away that the um, different particles ended up in different fractions. Not surprisingly, the heaviest were the metals, 2.4 SG is the fraction where it holds all the um, um, strings of copper and um, other metals. Fiberglass, the 1.8 to 2.4, and then a plastic in the um, lighter fractions, which not, is not unexpected. But you can see right away that the quality of material is um, much different in each um, gravity fraction. Looking at the calorific value, we've already seen that by um, separating the um, uh, metals, we increase the calorific value in our non-metal fraction. Now, looking farther into the SG fraction, we can see that 
increase in some of the SG fractions of calorific value is even high, comparable to high energy fuels. So this is something if we were to look at the energy recovery from particular uh, fractions. So uh, looking at the uh, grade of um, metals, meaning the percent of content of metals in various fractions, copper dominated in, uh, in this heavy fraction, which is not surprising. Uh, there is a lot of copper in the um, printed circle boards and the actual percent of copper was close to what we produce at the mine, even though even though when we look at this copper value, 40% copper in this SG fraction, this fraction was only 2.5% uh, mass. So not significant, but 40% copper, it means it's actually ready that it can be used for uh, smelting purposes, for example. So not significant um, mass content, but yet in terms of value, probably could pay for the recycling of rest of the non-metal fraction. So when we look at the um, content of flame retardants, because they were um, only fiberglass, many of, of the material that we separated in SG. So we can see that right away that the, um, the fiberglass would contain the most. Um, uh, and as we separate, we'll be reducing this uh, content of flame retardants in some fractions. So just virtually separated in the sizes, we can remove the most contaminated from the least contaminated by flame retardants, simply by um, separating them. So in the conclusions from the projects, um, actually the project um, ended after a couple of years and one of my PhDs graduated with the um, a doctorate just recently, and uh, there's um, a lot more work that we've done in looking into different technologies, how to process this. But for the sake of this presentation, I would like just to conclude um, that what we can do at least is the simple analysis to look at the opportunities. So separating metals from um, the PCB non-metal fraction increase the energy and large proportion of non-metals is recovered with energy content, which can be um, used as an energy recovery. Um, it, it's comparable to high energy fuels. So uh, obviously that has to be done with the um, appropriate technologies for in safe incineration. Flame retardants content in lighter fractions resin was reduced. So again, by sorting uh, this material, we can and actually uh, reduced the content in some fractions versus others. However, uh, comparing to the limits, none of the fractions uh, were above what's um, required for landfilling in British Columbia. So, but uh, looking forward into stricter regulations, um, we should rather do a better job than just uh, relying on the uh, limits of the landfilling, even though it's very important because uh, companies will not be allowed to dispose if they don't meet those uh, limits. So um, additional commodity metal recovery, it, uh, it could also uh, be um, uh, incentive for recycling non-metal fraction. And there may be various routes for utilization of, of these materials, such as use uh, reinforcing fiber uh, fillers, many composite materials, asphalt, cement mortar, and many others. Obviously, they have to be decontaminated from uh, these flame retardants before further uh, utilization. So this will provide us, um, I would say, a blueprint how we could go forward with recycling instead of concentrating on recovery uh, purely metals, uh, looking at some ways of doing it step by step and taking care of non-metal fraction, making sure that some of these materials like fiberglass, for example, could be utilized in, um, in other um, repurpose of upcycle as we sometimes refer. Another project that I would like to tell you about is LED, um, recycling technology development. So this is another recycling um, um, project that we um, were engaged. Actually, we have been engaged, we still uh, continue. Um, projects been going on for three years. We are pretty much designing it from the scratch. I'm sure you know um, that LED lamps became uh, quite a, um, a good product in a sense that 
they, they use up 90% less energy. They have um, higher lifespan, almost um, close to five years of service, very strong resistant to breakage. They don't use non-toxic mercury as opposed to the um, um, fluorescence lamp. So all good news. So when we look at statistics, the lighting in US accommodates for 6% and 15% of total electricity in Canada, 4% of residential. So it's quite substantial. So it's a, it's a good innovation, innova, innovation in terms of the market and energy saving. So when we look on the other hand on the market, it, it, it grew obviously, and we have annual growth 30%. So even if you compare this e-waste um, statistics is staggering compared to three to four, now we're growing 30%. And 2.5 million units of LED sold in British Columbia up in uh, 2018, oh, wonderful. This is all good, except that we don't have the recycling process for these lamps. So the recyclers, the company that we've been um, collaborating on this project, they recycle 90% of all lamps in BC, but they were stuck with it because they just kept getting all their equipment, all their e-waste without having equipment, proper equipment to recycle. So again, looking at statistics, it will grow and um, it rightly is the best solution for uh, in terms of um, energy saving. And as we can see, it will continue to grow. And um, the lesson from that is that we will uh, should think before we introduce some um, products, electronic products about the recycling. So from recycling options, looking at the lamp, it should be recyclable. The processes, there are a variety of processes, pyrolysis, hydrometallurgical leaching, supercritical, water oxidation, smelting, density, there are various of methods. However, in this instance, they were not put together. They were not um, um, available for the company that um, dealt with the lamp recycling. So that's why we had the opportunity to do this from the scratch for this company. So um, where did we start? Like, um, as you probably got it from my, um, short CV that Professor Santato presented. I'm mineral processing person. We deal with the rocks. We have to crush, size, reduce, and then separate. So we start to look that from that perspective. So we use various technologies, the ones that um, work, threading, hammer mill. Um, and then we also looked for the other new technologies that could help us to do better, cleaner job. So simply by crushing and grinding, Again, we can separate, easily look at the ways that we can use simple uh, gravity separation to concentrate products. And we did that. And we also look for um, better technologies, newer technologies. So one of those was high voltage fragmentation technology. So that was that we venture into. We, the aim was to evaluate this technology, even though it was tested in mineral processing, still uh, not being used commercially. It's too small in terms of capacity, batch system not continuous, would not work in um, mining operations. However, it has been also shown to um, be efficient in electronics. Some studies were done on the cell phones, others on uh, printed circuit boards. So there were some promising um, opportunities. So we step into that. The, um, you can look at the parameters, operating parameters, so voltage discharge. So this is the high voltage um, uh, fragmentation technology um, relies on the, uh, utilize the electrical energy to break the materials at the grain boundary. So high voltage rise, um, less than one microsecond, a huge voltage is used in there. So they cause electrical explosion inside of the rock. So it's almost, I've learned recent, it's like plasma formation in there. So it generates fewer fines in terms of um, efficiency and liberates all the parts in minerals, works well, and also has been shown then in e-waste, 98% um, of copper got liberated and concentrated in, so to speak, coarser size. 
Um, and so this is the technology that we venture into um, our test work. I have short video, I will see if that works. So this is to show you how um, beautiful it looks when it um, dismantles the electronics. So here's an example of how the cell phone, obviously this is old generation cell phone, the batteries are usually removed anyway before any recycling crashing size reduction. So in this case as well, and obviously the whole phone was put in a, um, a vessel which serves as the working uh, environment for, the, for this uh, dismantling. And the medium is the water, and now the electrical pulses are generated. So huge energy, high 50 kilovolt is being delivered to this. And pulses mean number of pulses would be, depending, can be in tens or hundreds. And obviously every time you deliver this pulse, there's more energy release in there. So the more process, the more powerful the disintegration. So as you can see very nicely, uh, clean, clean midland. So that's, we got really empowered by looking at videos like that and we uh, venture into testing this technology and I'll show you some of the examples how it uh, worked for us. So let me just step out of this. I think we have to go back to the materials. So in our case, we picked um, eight different designs of LED lamps. They can come in different sizes, shape, shape and sizes. So we picked eight for that experimental work. And um, we, we tested under the following condition, voltage discharge 180 kilovolt, discharge frequency 5 hertz, and number of pulses. We did that at two different um, um, numbers, 25 pulses and 100. And after the LED lamps were um, disintegrated, in uh, in Selfrac, Selfrac is the um, name for that technology. So it's a brand name. Uh, we screened it and we analyzed for metals and we'll show you what happened when we did that. So when we look at the fragmentation, um, several of the lamps did not um, did not uh, perform well. Uh, as you could see, they were not um, disintegrated. They did not. Um, they were designed, as I mentioned at the beginning, the LED lamps, one of the characteristics that they're very strong for breakage and that's shown to be the case, definitely for some designs more than others. And here's another um, four lamps where two of them out of this um, series of lamps did not um, follow the um, trend of being disintegrated. When look at the energy of how much um, energy was um, was used and energy efficiency, you can see it compared on average that there was quite a um, huge amount of energy. And if you compare this on average 42 after 24 pulses and 150 when we use 100 um, pulses on average for all the lamps, those that the technology worked for, others not necessary, sample two and six and eight um, were not disintegrated. Um, by comparison, typical combination circuit would only use two to a 10 kilowatt per ton. So um, the energy I use is forbidable for the continuous system. However, if the energy is in renewable and if it's used, for example, only for pre-weakening stage, it might actually be quite good um, an example of technology, clean and, and uh, non-invasive to some extent. We, when we crush and grind, we generate a lot of dust. We lose some of the metals. Uh, for example, plated metals would uh, uh, dissipate. Um, so the, this is the opportunity for looking at something which is um, a lot better in terms of uh, cleanliness. However, the energy values are quite high and we have to 
um, think about that as well, where the energy is coming from. In terms of the size reductions, how did we do? Actually, it was true that with increased discharge energy, the fine fraction was increased most of the cases, however, not significantly. So we have bars for the 25 and 100 pulses. And uh, well, definitely the coarser fractions are still significant for some um, type of lamps. So that means it did not generate a lot of fines. Uh, we did also liberations. We estimated liberation um, in each of the samples after 25 and 100 pulses, looking at the material that was disintegrated. We look at the percent of liberation. So as you can see, all particles in this coarser fraction were nearly fully liberated, especially at high pulse rate. So that means this is very good um, opportunity to get most of the metals in liberated um, uh, state. With increased pulse, metals liberated also to finer fraction, but not um, for some types more than others, but not considerably, not significantly. Metal present in a coarser fraction also um, were also uh, liberated. So a pretty satisfactory outcome out of this um, out of this um, experiment. So high voltage can liberate metal at coarser. So the conclusions were pretty straightforward. Degree of liberation, perfect. It looks clean, it looks good. It liberates metals. Um, however, it's not applicable to bulbs with metal casing as we have um, examined. Energy consumption, very high, conventional. However, it could be used as a pre weakening stage. Um, or if we have a renewable sources and if you can figure out the energy and cost and, and uh, CO2, that could be um, another exercise to look at. Um, when we look at the cases where we can, um, instead of grinding, shredding to fine sizes, when we can somehow um, dismantle or lead to the process where the crushing is not very intense and we can end up with the larger pieces of our LED as we did here by just using hammer mill, we ended up with much coarser um, uh, particle sizes. Then another option uh, becomes available such as sorting. Sorting usually is very um, efficient at coarser particle sizes. Um, and that would also be available for let's say something I call like X-ray transmission. So X-ray transmission is nothing else than what you've seen a lot of times when you were traveling, going through the airports, scanning your luggage through the um, X-ray scanner. So that was exactly the scanner we're talking about uh, here. So um, the X-ray penetrates into the material. Some of the energy gets absorbed by the material while rays transmitted. The signal is detected and it's um, converted into the um, atomic density versus the um, atomic uh, versus the density. And um, we use dual energy so we can pick up the lowest signal and the highest signal. And then the image is processed. Then we can classify the particles according to the density zones. So that way we can separate by density. And we did that. So we found that actually that um, we did a really good job because the plastic rubber and uh, PCB and metals um, were quite well separated, sorted by the um, XRT. So this is on LED lamps. Another opportunity uh, when we are at this sort of coarser size reduction that we allow for coarser particle uh, to be um, a process, optical sorting is where we can look actually at each piece because the color would also be uh, distinguished. So we use the optical sorting. So the particles of plastic, PCB, rubber, and aluminum were um, analyzed and the software was, um, was designed to recognize these. Then we correlated um, blue, green, green, red, blue, green, and, and various um, um, opportunities to uh, correlate. And what we found that there were criteria that we could very easily separate rubber at 98%, um, 89% recovery it means from the mass coming in um, almost 90% was sorted out. So this is pretty good. 
So we were able to reject rubber and the product that we end up with 98% rubber and 2% plastic. Another criteria set up according to the graphs that we um, generated from, from the um, RGB um, data, uh, we could actually reject the uh, PCBs um, with the 93.5% um, content with almost 88% of the recovery value. So this is pretty impressive. So I think there is a lot of technologies that we can put together for much better recycling outcomes. Um, in terms of LED, the story was that at least in British Columbia, there is no um, uh, process um, patented or process that could recy recycling companies take from the shelf. So it has to be uh, developed. That's what our group is working on. So we're really proud to have this opportunity. Um, and as we can see, we can't go outside of our, our own box. I'm not sure if recycling has their own box, but they usually have been um, looking at the easy hanging, low hanging fruit for technologies where, you know, looking at something that is available. But maybe it's time that we start looking at these um, recycling processes as we do in mineral processing with a very take care of every bit of material that we have to process because of the value of this material. Another uh, short project that I would like to share with you is about the gold recovery from e-waste using ecological re reagents. I I'm sure that many people from hydrometallurgy with hydrometallurgy background have a lot of example of that. And uh, But this is one of the cases where um, the project was very short. Uh, we collaborated with um, University of Antioquia from Colombia. And um, I really liked that project. The student came for half a year. She did really an um, excellent um, job in, as you will see. So she uh, used this um, agent, ammonium persulfate, which uh, provided selective uh, oxidation of various metals to liberate gold to actually um, uh, peel off the gold. So um, the idea is that when we have our electronics, Usually we don't have a lot of gold, even looking at your um, iPhone, you would uh, have very little of gold. You have uh, maybe 30 milligrams of gold and gold is plated on the contacts on electronics. So the moment you start crushing, grinding, sh uh, shredding this material, a lot of this gold would just dissipate. It will just go into the dust and, and you might be losing it. So the idea was to actually use these reagents to immerse in um, electronic contacts, electronics in this solution of ammonium persulfate, and that will lead to selective oxidation of various metals and releasing the gold. So no leaching except this um, um, residence time for that process was 10 minutes, so very short. And after that, the gold was uh, released and temperature um, was was less than 100 degrees. I think it was about 95 degrees of the, of the, um, the solution. So the feed selective oxidation of metals led to the release of gold. And it was quite amazing that it could have been done um, as simply as that. Um, not sure um, this um, student um, ended up going back to uh, Colombia and I believe she opened up her own recycling plant. So this is something to learn um, from, uh, from that, uh, learning the new way of uh, finding your opportunities in life. So in conclusions, that was pretty um, interesting project. So the gold was released and the reagents, eco-friendly, non-toxic reagent that was used in addition um, showed quite good selectivity it was on, on bench scale. It, I, I'm sure by now it's been patented. I have not checked with the student, but I know that she's been working in the recycling industry um, after she completed her PhD. So the process was fast, effective releasing. So the final conclusions for this seminar um, we have to look at better solutions. We have to look at something which can um, provide us with this more simpler, less invasive and uh, 
Uh, physical separation could be a step done by step by step sequence. And that will present us with more opportunities to recover material at coarser particle sizes, uh, try to increase efficiency of recycling, um, improve on non-metal fraction um, for reutilization. So in addition, provide to reduce the mass of the material. As we go step by step, we reduce the mass, even if there is only final stage that we have to use hydrometallurgy, pyrometallurgy, we'll end up with much smaller mass to do that at the very end. So the e-waste recycling becomes more challenging. Um, if we were to um, if we were to recover these non-metal fractions, um, because it does not have a value. However, um, that can be transformed into a value added product if we can extract it in such a form that could be useful for repurpose, for let's say um, reutilization. So we call it upcycle it. However, the recovery on non-metal fraction is um, not, not necessary to close the slope and try to go into the direction of creating circular economy at the same time. So at this point, I just would like to acknowledge my students and all the organizations that provided uh, financial or um, other um, support for the projects. Well, thank you so much and merci beaucoup. Denis, it's on you or me? Uh, well, uh, I would say, uh, Clara, that you can go ahead and, and uh, uh, d delegate the Q&A session. And if you need, I can always jump in to help. So uh, I have a question. Uh, yeah, one second, Arthur. I just would like to thank uh, uh, really deeply so Professor Lusko for the really great uh, um, uh, seminar, Maria. I knew you were a good scientist, but... Uh, I confirm and it's an answer to the evaluation. <laughs> Please, Arthur, go ahead. Uh, if I understand from your talk, I, I always imagined that batteries were considered part of e-waste. And if I understand from your talk, they are not. Well, they are part of the e-waste, but normally in when we recycle, we usually remove them. So they, they yeah, they are also- The receptive stream. Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. But okay. for this, for, I mean, just for the sake of the separation, normally in physicals, you know, when we crush and grind, we have to remove, otherwise they'll explode. And yeah. in you, I guess you've also seen that, that they are removed. But yes, they are being recycled. They have to be recycled, right? So, yeah. yes. Please, Alberto. Okay, uh, thank you very much for the, uh, for the presentation. I uh, have a very negative uh, uh, view about uh, this kind of problem in general. I'm sorry for the, I have a couple of questions. I, I, I will reduce them, but um, uh, I, I really don't understand. And even I don't uh, accept the notion of circular, circular economy. Uh, so in order to clarify this fact, I would like to have uh, something uh, a, a little bit different that concerns how much energy is necessary in order to produce a component uh, and the total energy uh, that has to be used in order to recycle and then reproduce the same component. It seems to me that if we put the thermodynamics inside this problem, we must lose energy uh, we must dissipate energy and we must have an impact and this impact cannot be circular, must be a degradation. I don't, don't see in your talk this kind of degradation. This is one point. So can you provide me a ratio of the energy required in order to produce a component, a single component, and then take the same material, recycle them and reproduce it, which is the ratio? Well, we haven't engaged in this kind of calculations. Well, simply when the idea behind my talks is that we're using the simple separation techniques like gravity, the coarser, the better. So use the water base or something which would not um, 
engage a lot of energy in, in separation. This is talking about separation the waste. But I do agree with you that, for example, producing the plastic is much cheaper than recycling it because that means the process to get the plastic and repolymerize would be enormous. But on the other hand, like what recycling companies will be facing and they're facing right now that, for example, the restrictions for landfilling become more stringent. Um, so for example, recyclers now are required to pay for landfilling. They have to decontaminate. So there may be at the point where if they're not allowed to landfill, the value would be for paying landfilling. So now you have to take that into account that some of the cost of energy may be recuperated by the fact that if you're not allowed to do something, if you're not allowed to uh, put the mess out there, then that could be the cost. I'm, you know, yeah, I agree with you that even with all the possible, we might not be able to end up with zero, but we have to end up with some decent minimal of waste. And uh, so I think it has to be looked from the fundamental um, science point of view and energy balance. Yeah, so it's, yeah, the, it, the, the, I would say it is the, um, it is the compromise. You know, the standard standards um, have to be higher because what's happening right now, um, we're losing a lot of these metals in there. So this is a must. We, first thing is to go after that. But there's also some other sorts of materials that could become um, like fiberglass. If we can recover them and use them for other products, we already reduced 10 or 20% of this mass that would be landfill and somebody needs to pay for this landfilling. And at some point they might need to even decontaminate to the point that they have to do it. They have to put the money in there. So, so it is, a, it is um, continuing discussion the circular economy, it's all, it's the balance between what we value. Is it the environmental cost? Um, is it the health cost of, of people who, when they live around the areas, around the landfills? So yeah, th there's a lot of discussion about that and it's not a simple concept. Um, but I think even, you know, in terms as a human beings, if we produce something and, and the way the electronic industry is going, it's unsustainable. We, we have to do better and we have to uh, step up what we are doing. Um, I, I, I agree with you. Uh, the, the problem is that when we introduce recycling that provides the general idea that uh, since we recycle, we can continue, we, we, we can continue uh, uh, consuming. And the problem is consumption. So we yes. must reduce the it's consumption. This is the right way to go. If we send the message that recycling give us the opportunity to continue with our style of life that we have here today, it's not a good, uh, a good uh, path uh, for, for the environment. And I have another question concerning uh, sorting the, 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 uh, the uh, LEDs. Uh, have you uh, used, or I, I, I don't see, but uh, uh, a, a strong uh, a high power lasers that you can send into the material, produce plasma, and then recover the spectrum from the plasma and determine the, the nature of the component and the, the amount of the component that you're looking for. Instead of using uh, um, visual or light or common light detection, uh, sending a high power laser that produces plasma, recover the, 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 the light from the plasma, then uh, determine the, uh, the spectrum, and then you can see exactly what you have in, into the sample. Have you used, or are you intended to use something like that? I, well, there, there's a lot of opportunities. We just, as I said, we went just for low hanging fruit, you know, whatever was available, whatever thought would work, and it did. So the idea was just to provide some opportunities, like how can we do this, you know, at a course, like let's do that and we reduce the mass and then you go for the next technology. Because we are really working with real uh, scenarios, like this is like recycling that needs to have tools. 
So this is where we tested everything, what we could, you know, have hands on, whatever we could imagine that would work. But you're right, like it, it could be improved. It could be, you know, more specific. It can analyze better and more. But the bottom line is like, you need to start somewhere, right? So, so this, these are the technologies that are available and that could do the work. Thank you. Thank you so much. Very interesting questions. Excellent, thank you. François, uh, tu peux y aller. Merci. Oui, merci. Uh, thank you very much for a very interesting talk. Um, I was wondering if uh, I understand it's difficult to take apart uh, circuits and all that, but on the other hand, um, in the middle of the of that, you have uh, pieces of silicon that could be reused uh, if you scrape off the surface and all that. Uh, has there been, uh, or, or both sides to, to, to recuperate the, I mean, everything is either on one side or, or the other of the, the silicon chip. Uh, uh, are there efforts in, in that way or it's not worth it uh, economically? Well, I guess we, we look at something what's, what's kind of efficient or what's possible. Yeah, obviously you can, again, like spend um, energy and, you know, looking at details of it, but, I think it's, it's all the costs that it can be added on, like looking for a better way. And well, right now only the metals um, are presenting this opportunity. Everything else like the plastic and all the other materials are not as worthy. So engaging like um, more sophisticated technology, I would say, or more um, energy intensive technology, um, it's, Again, it's the cost value for you know uh, for for the processing, right? So, yeah, there, there are many ideas, and I'm sure you, um, material scientists um, have probably a lot better idea how you can um, unpeel or un undo many things. But I guess well, the bottom line is it's the waste, and if you know the, after the metals are removed, then you know the other material. Um, costs are so low that you have to pretty much balance wh what's worth it, what's not, and how far you can go with investing energy and, and other processes to, to, to get the pure uh, substance, right? But with the fiberglass, what we found was that, you know, even like if the part of the fiberglass could be uh, reused, there's still possible to use in, you know, cement industry fillers. So they don't have to be in this like you know, 100% pure fiberglass, right? And the size matters as well. So there are many things, I mean, and the end thing is like, where you, we wanna use, we, we have to learn. Like from my perspective, from mineral processing, we know from the beginning to the end, we are getting this material, this is the uh, quality of material, I have to do this to get there. And here, this open, open door, like, what's what I'm trying, like the metal is the only value that it, it's worthwhile at this point. And everything else is like how I need to know what I'm producing and wh what for. So this is what the balance is. If we come up with the, we have to, I find myself in this type of uh, industry, it cannot be just job of one um, uh, engineer. It has to be job with design, how we design for cycling, how how do we process and you know the material scientists, what, what do we do with this? Like you tell me, like I have this, where do I use that? So that has to be orchestrated effort. It no longer is just like um, one at a time um, that we do this. So I think, yes, I, I in my mind, like if we don't recycle and uh, it's bad. Obviously, we have to temper the um, temper the con consumption, but I don't see how we can do that. If we buy a cell phone and the cell phone lasts only a couple of years, and the technology is evolving almost on daily basis, um, and we need that technology all the time, better and better, I don't see that um, being easily done. So to cut down on the consumption now more appliances are built with those electronics 10, 20 years ago, they were not. And it's, it seems to be um, 
very um, destructive, self-destructive um, cycle. So, so I think we are really competing. I, I yeah, it's, it's 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 very hard, you know, to to say that. Like, I mean, my phone. It's it's not even that software. After one year, is pretty much, you know, two years is is max that you can get out of it. It's 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 disturbing the way it it's being it's being this and it's not designed for it's also not being designed for recycling so it's 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 pretty much a lot of big issues that uh, have to be solved at the same time and an uh, example with this led lamp um they were introduced they were supposed to last five years obviously some of them malfunction that's fine but then there's no technology so they just stockpiling it and obviously in recycling, it's it's not continuous as in mining. We would have to, um, it, it, it is module, it has to be module, has to be flexible because the design of electronics will change. What was five years ago is will be different five years from now. And, and if you're collecting something years, something, you know, five years before you have to be ready for that technology to be dismantled again. So it's 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 a lot of things. And apparently, I just read one paper recently. It was very interesting that um, there is also some economics behind it. That you know, it's a it, it, the uh, research was done on recycling of some cell phones um, for five years. Let's say models of of telephones, um, and uh, the uh, the the content of all the metals. Um, I think it was pretty much specified for each metal that, for example, um, for gold, the junk, the electronic waste from five years before, recycle would provide value for gold, which is produced within 14 days at the mine. So this is, again, we, we can't really justify that. The recycling would provide us, we will sub you know, will satisfy the demand. It will never satisfy the demand, but it is the right thing to do. We can't just keep piling the garbage and without thinking about it that, you know, we generating so much. So there's some social ethical issues to that. And I think we have to build the expertise. We have to be better at it. We have to make sure that we, we do that better. Thank you, Maria. Uh, David, please go ahead, please. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Clara. And uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Lusko. Uh, I really appreciated your presentation. Uh, I met the professor at the University of Sherbrooke. Uh, I realize that this question is probably outside your focus, but I was hoping that uh, perhaps due to your close interactions with uh, some of the PCB recyclers, uh, I was wondering if you know if there has been any activity either at the recycler or perhaps prior to the recycler uh, with regards to recovering the potentially functional components from the populated PCB board. Well, I, no, I haven't actually that project that I uh, was elaborating on, it was only one year and the recycler actually moved to Ontario. So I, I'm, I don't have any more information um, about anything else what, what, what they do that but I know they their concept was to to be very much into this uh, circle or I would say economy to to make sure that everything is done at most efficient way at, at sort of step by step so I don't have any more details about about the process okay fair enough thank you very much thank you Mm. Other questions? Go, Alberto, you can go with another one. Okay, um, uh, the, the last question is a very interesting one, but it seems to me that it's very difficult because the recovery populated PCB uh, at its own uh, uh, with the, uh, the technology that is changing uh, very fast uh, inside the, the, uh, the circuit themselves, uh, it's a very, very uh, difficult to, uh, uh, to take up. But uh, I, I have a, a question concerning the, uh, the, uh, the PCBs, the treatment of the PCBs uh, themselves. 
if I, I understood correctly, you told us that uh, you burn them. So you are burning the, uh, the PCBs. And my question is, which will be the, or which are the, the impact of this uh, burning process uh, into the environment? What happened with the gases and and the products that uh, came from this uh, this process that itself? No, no. The idea was not to burn it, but I mean, if there is nothing else, if you recover oh, most. Okay, of the so I, I misunderstood the the process. Yeah. No, the but idea it, is not to burn it. You were talking about gases. The, 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 you, you were talking about gases. Where well, this, I guess yeah. in, in, it has to be in control. In, Incineration. So I, I think in Europe, they do a lot of incineration and it's, it's actually done very well. So they do have uh, processes. I'm not a chemical engineer, but I understand that um, actually their incineration process is um, better. You know, it means that they have the, they, they know how to treat the gases after they incinerate. So energy recovery from that. But yeah, I'm, I'm not chem chemical engineer to, to tell you details about it, but um, apparently there is better technology to do that safer. I wouldn't say 100% safe, but th th there's things that you can do. Well, you know, even I, I'm coming from the coal industry, there's like gasification, liquefaction, you can actually do better with coal than just burn it for, you know, for energy. So, yeah, so the, there is technology which actually is um, applicable for, and I, I hope that that's what um, European um, Commission is talking about, because I've read that they actually, some of the countries, they, they do this energy recovery by uh, burning some of the organic, um, uh, remnants from the recycling. So I, I think that there's, there is some uh, good technology there, but how good, I, I cannot claim that. I, I'm not sure. And I, I, I don't think it's cheap either if you have to clean all the gases and, and, and yeah, so I'm, I'm not sure how, how would that go add up to the cost of all the um, recycling, the final end of that. Well, maybe in the interest of time, uh, we kind of maybe take one last question if there is one from the Yeah. <clears throat> Otherwise, we are ready to, to take the question from the student of the seminar course. Well, yeah, so if there are no questions. Uh, just question. one question. Uh, uh, Maria, I've got a question for the talk. My question is the, the content of the flame retardant is something established by law or it's... Uh, there are other rules for that. Thank you. Well, it, it is like, for example, for the landfilling in, in British Columbia, there is this like standard method that leaching from, from the soil. So they, they actually, the test work is standardized. And then there is some um, values that they, they present in those guidelines. Um, according to British Columbia, whatever we are processing, it was safe to dispose. But uh, obviously, <coughs> Uh, by separating, sorting these things, we could reduce that if we can remove some parts and, you know, um, so that, that I guess each, each jurisdiction has their own guidelines for, you know, what can be in terms of elements. Uh, it's a leachable characteristics of the material that matters that they actually uh, have that test for. But for the PCB, the content is the same for all the producers? What do you mean for the PCBs? Well, I mean, in terms of e-waste, do you get all the mix and match of the uh, different PCBs, right? So it's it's not one type. So okay. that's... So, okay. yeah. Yeah. Right. so, with, so the, pro with, the problem with the recycling is that you actually recycle all sorts of things. So it's not just one. Um, I remember sometimes the question is like, oh, because we say we don't really know because it's a mixture of things and the PC boards from five years, 10 years, it's, 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 it's actually a lot more heterogeneous than just a recycling material from let's say um, current circuit boards. So doing the study on the pure materials is different than what you actually deal when you have to um, recycle um, something which has been uh, 
stockpile for for past or 10 or five years. That's what we found that actually in some of those there were two different FR4, FR5, so there were different uh, uh, boards. So that showed up in analysis that we could actually tell where they end up as we recycled. So you, you can follow that, but receiving the uh, bulk of the material, you have no idea what's in that. It's a mix and match of, of various um, uh, manufacturers, different type of circuit boards, small and big and so on and so forth. It, it, it is very heterogeneous material. Uh, from the point of view of, of uh, uh, recycling. But uh, 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 the PCBs can be quite, quite different. Uh, yes. Because yeah. uh, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, if you increase the frequency uh, at the uh, time that we are using uh, uh, cell telephones and so on, uh, PCBs are not uh, made from uh, glass fiber at all. And yeah. you need yeah, to yeah, change the permittivity of the material. So you use, you use another kind of structure and probably you cannot treat in the same way as the- yes, uh, That's right. The, so uh, five yeah. years from now or three years from now when we start you know, uh, recycling these will be different. So it has to be module. You cannot set the system for just this because whatever we collected five years ago, it will not be the same for, you know, as, as it happened with those lamp recyclers that we um, had the case in our study. So they were not prepared, they did not no, they were expecting that LED. It's it's a good thing, but um, yeah, need, now you need to have to work from the scratch. I would open the question time for the students. Well, so so uh, the, the the students of Polytechnic Montreal, you mean the registered students? So so I think in the interest of time because this is already uh, past the allocated uh, budget, temporal budget